All right, now, Numbers chapter 11 is, um, I'm going to be focusing in on here, of course, the, the complaining of the children of Israel. And this is a pretty strong chapter showing us how God feels about this and how, um, you know, and, and all the things that happened as a result. Now, um, well, I want to start off just mentioning, you know, you are the only one that's going to have control over the way that you perceive things in your life. Everybody in this world has struggles, has different things to deal with. It's easy to look at someone else and think, man, that person has it made. Man, if I were only in their shoes, you know, they've got all of this money. They've got such a great family. They've got what, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're looking on somebody else and just saying, wow, that just must be a great life. My life is miserable. You have no idea what is going on in that person's life. Honestly, you don't. I don't care, and I've learned this. I don't, it doesn't matter what you know, uh, income level you're in. Everybody's struggling financially. And it sounds kind of funny, but it's true. You, 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 everybody's working hard. You know, they should be. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, not, every, not everyone is working hard. But some people find themselves, you know, you're in different situations. And, I mean, there's people that, that have, you know, maybe a million dollars. And they're still working real hard and thinking, oh, man, I've got all these struggles. And I've got this problems, And I've got this debt. And I've got all these other things to pay for. It, it, you can say that might be ridiculous. And maybe it is. But we all have our struggles. Everybody does. And... What, it, it's actually wickedness and covetousness to be looking at other people in that way. To be thinking, I wish I had it like them. Now, you might, again, you might think that on the outside, but you don't really know what's going on in their life. You have no idea. And if you were to know everything, you might be like, actually, I don't want that life. I'm okay with where I'm at. And... But this is the thing. We have that power to choose what we're going to focus on, the things that we're going to be, be having in our minds on a continual basis. If it's going to be our problems and the negative things and just everything that's going wrong and how much I hate this and how much I hate that, you're going to be a miserable person. Just, just right off the bat, you're, you're, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to have joy because you'll be focusing on the things that are wrong instead of focusing on the things that God has given you. Now, if you were to take a minute this morning and just think, what are all the great things that I have had in my lifetime that God has given me? Blessings specifically from God. And if you're saved, you can start with your salvation. And you can end with your salvation and that ought to be enough. Being saved from a burning, fiery pit of hell of torment and torture for an eternity because of what you've done wrong. Because of sins that you've committed against God. God's wiped that slate clean for you. Now, I don't care what you're going through in your entire life. If you're saved, you ought to be able to think about that and think, Praise God and thank you, Lord, for saving me from eternal destruction forever and ever and ever. See, the problem is that's not something that's in our thoughts very often because we don't see the burning, fiery furnace in front of our face. It's in the center of the earth right now, so it's not something that you're, you're used to thinking about because it's not just, just hitting you on a daily basis of, of that reality of it being there. But we know that it's there. We know that it's true just as much as we know God's word is true. We need to maintain the proper focus in our life. Now, it doesn't just end with our salvation, though. For I'm sure with everybody in this room today, you have a lot more to be thankful for even than that. Now, that alone, as like I said, that's enough. That is, that is way more than enough to be thankful for. Because not only are you avoiding the punishment, but you get to be in heaven. With the Lord. And, and being in heaven is not like, eh, it's okay. You know, I mean, it's, it's great. It's like, eh, it, it's all right. Yeah, like, it's kind of hyped up. I don't know what all the hype's about. No, that's, I mean, heaven's a great place. The streets are paved with gold. You know, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's this, this wonderful place where you're going to have a new body. You're not going to have the aches and pains. You're, you know, there's going to be peace. There's going to be just, just, just everything good and righteous. It's going to be an excellent place to be in. 
And the, the, you know, both aspects of your salvation is amazing and is plenty to be thankful for. But, but what else do you have? I mean, think about your children. If you have children, think about, I mean, the Bible says the children are a heritage of the Lord. They're, they're a blessing, being blessed with children. It's, it's a good thing to have children. Do you have a shelter? Do you have a home? Do you have a place where you can, you can be covered from all of the elements around us? A heater, an air conditioning, right? I mean, we now have, have, have so many comforts and so many things that, that we've just grown to expect and just be like, well, of course I'm going to have air conditioning. I'm in Arizona. Well, guess what? People in Arizona didn't always have air conditioning. <laughs> they didn't even always have vehicles. Everything about it, you have a vehicle. Now, we just had, a, you know, a, we, have, we had two vehicles, and we just had one of them break. It would be easy because of the way we, we condition ourselves to get used to things. It might be easy for me to say, oh man, what a burden. What, this is just horrible. Now I'm only down to one vehicle. What am I ever going to do? God, why did this happen to me? Oh, I can't believe this. And I could just have this rotten, miserable, ungrateful, and unthankful attitude and just live a miserable life. Or I can say, hey, thank God we have another vehicle Thank God I don't have to miss work. I can still do some of the things I need to do. Thank God. Hey, that vehicle was given to me anyways. It was a gift. Praise the Lord. We had it for the amount of time we had it for. This is the type of attitude you need to have no matter what's going on in your life. Now you could say, oh yeah, it's easy for you to... Yeah, it is easier. It is a lot easier when, when you're blessed with more things and you lose something to say that. But, but just because it's easier doesn't mean you shouldn't have that attitude. And just because it's harder in some situation doesn't mean you shouldn't have that attitude. You always ought to have the right attitude and view things the right way. And even as Job, right? Job himself said when he had, I mean, they were talking about a wealthy man. He was a righteous man and God blessed Job tremendously. He had lots of blessings, right? But when he lost everything in Job chapter 1, when all of his financial good... When, when everything, his children, when everything was taken away from him before the devil affected his health, in, in Job chapter 1, he said this. I don't want to mess it up. It said, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. And you remember those events because they looked like they were coming from God. They looked like they could have been because they were these almost miraculous events. I mean, he had a whirlwind came and, you know, the roof collapsed on all of his children. Fire came down out of heaven and consumed his servants and the, his cattle or whatever. You know, there's these things that happen. It's like, how in the world could this even happen? This isn't normal. And all of them happened in succession for him. To, he could have been wrong and wrongly been like, God, why are you doing this to me? It wasn't God. That was the devil. But look at his attitude. He said, when I, when I was born, when I, had my, when I was given my life, I didn't have anything. I was born naked. He didn't have any clothing. didn't have anything. Everything that he received from that moment forward is a blessing. And he recognized it as such. And he says, okay, the Lord gave. And guess what? He took it away again. God's still blessed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And it may be a difficult thing to do. And this is why I'm preaching this sermon this morning. Because we all have a tendency to get so used to the things that we have that we come to expect them. That we come to just think that this is a requirement of life to have these things that we have. And it's, an, it's, it's epidemic in this country. That's why people are you know, up in arms and saying, well, everyone has the right to have health care. Or we have the right to have a living. or whatever. I mean, whatever it is, it's like, no, you don't. You have the right to your own life. You have the right to make your decisions. But, but hey, if you want something, you're going to have to work for it. If God blesses you with things, great. But it's not this natural right that, uh, that someone just owes you. That someone doesn't, you know, I don't have this, you owe it to me. I mean, who owes it to you? 
people come up with this fictitious entity of the, you know, the government. Well, the government owes it to you. No. The government doesn't produce anything. They're just taking money from other people and giving it to you. You don't have this right. And this is this, this entitlement type of an attitude of saying, well, I deserve all of this stuff is the wrong attitude to have. Because when you start getting focused on the things that you don't have, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be, it's going to be wicked, covetous type of an attitude. And God hates it. And let's look at the way God views this. Let's look at Numbers chapter 11 where we started off reading. And I'm totally going off of my... I got way outside of my notes, so let's see how I could get back in to, to the flow that I had laid out here. But, um, all right, before we get into that, this, this is a good point. Because it's easy for us to get into this mindset. And, and you know, oftentimes when we read this about the children of Israel, because I've had this thought quite a bit when I read about this, like, how could they be so selfish or how could they be so stiffening how you know how could they do this stuff how could they have this type of an attitude and but when you really think about it i could understand how they can have this type of attitude let's look at verse number four of numbers 11 it says in the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting now obviously falling and lusting is not a good thing the Bible says we're not supposed to lust, we're not supposed to covet. It says, And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. Not, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof is the color of bdellium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. Um, so these people, they have this, you know, they're used to when they were in Egypt, they had a variety of foods they can eat. Right? I mean, they had fish, they had garlic, they had you know, all the different spices, cucumbers, vegetables, all these different things that they could eat. Now, and, and just to get in their mindset, they've been eating manna for 40 years in the wilderness. Year after year, day, day after day after day. Imagine eating the same exact thing morning, afternoon, evening. Just the same thing day after after day, after day, after day, after day, and just, and just it keeps going and going and going. And how would you react? Would you start to complain about it? How would you feel? Would, would you be focused on that and thinking, oh, manna again? You know, can we have something other than manna, please? Can we not have to eat this stuff? every single day but that's the wrong attitude to have it's the wrong attitude to have and this is what god's explaining to us and we have to kind of get into this mindset and think about well what if, what if you were limited to beans every single day every meal all you had to eat were beans that's it every single meal you have beans and what <laughs> and if you like beans that's great right every day but but think about it every i mean i know for myself I've had, you know, we've had made food and have leftovers and it's like, oh, I don't want to eat that again. But that's a poor attitude. And think about the situation that these people are in. They're thinking about the things that they're lacking from Egypt. Now, was Egypt a good place for them to be in? No. They were, in, they were enslaved. They were in bondage. I mean, they had taskmasters that were beating them because they weren't working hard enough because they're, you know, they're putting in all of this time. They were, they were literally slaves to the Egyptians. And God miraculously came and, and delivered them completely free. And then they go into the wilderness where there isn't anything to eat. God provides food for them. God gives them what they need. The, the, the manna that he's given them, it's healthy for them. It's what they need to survive. Now, we have the added benefit of getting extra pleasure 
out of the foods that we eat. That's why, you know, there's nothing sinful or wrong about using spices and making things taste good and having a variety in your food that you eat. You can get pleasure out of that. But if you don't have that, if God hasn't given that to you, don't you dare start to complain about what you have. This is what the Bible's teaching us. And again, it's easy to, when you first read over, just be like, oh yeah, yeah, those, those wicked Israelites, I can't believe that they were being so, you know, such, having such a bad attitude. But what would you do? Day after day after day, the same thing. And they knew what it was like to have it otherwise. They said, I remember that. We remember, man, we, we used to eat fish. We used to, you know. But they're focused on their problems, not on their blessings. God's leading them into the promised land where they're going to have all of this stuff. I mean, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And, you know, the, the, remember the, the grapes that they carried on the, on the vine between the two of them and just, just how great and fruitful and lush that the promised land was where God was leading them to. They knew God was leading them there. He told them already. But they still had this bad attitude. And this bad attitude is real dangerous. We want to be able to catch ourselves when we're having this type of an attitude. When we start to realize, wait a minute, I'm starting to complain about things that I have or things that I don't have. If you don't have them, God is, hasn't given it to you. Okay? You ought not to even be thinking about those things. And if you, if you don't have them, God hasn't given it to you, fine. Be happy with the things that you have in this lifetime. As I mentioned, God has already blessed them. He blessed them with food. He didn't let them starve. He gave them what they needed. All they needed to do, think about this, all they needed to do was just gather it up. They didn't have to work for it. They didn't have to plow the ground. They didn't have to do any extra work involved. It was just a matter of just gathering it. Every day they just had to go out and gather their food. The food was already there for them. They just had to go collect it. Not very difficult. And it was on the ground. They didn't have to climb up in a tree. They didn't have to use any extra tools. Just, just go gather it and bring it in. And they found other things to do with it. That's why I said they ground it. They, you know, they fried it. They had all different, different ways of preparing it. It was still the same meal, though. But they, um, you know, they became bored with it, and they lusted, and they wanted more. And this is something we have to look out for in our life. It's too easy to become discontented with the things that you have and, and to want more. Now, look at some of the ramifications that ended up as a result of their complaining. Look at verse number 1 of where we started reading in chapter 11. It says, And when the people complained, it <laughs> displeased the Lord. So it's displeasing to God. God doesn't want to hear you're complaining. Now, when you have struggles and problems, yeah, go to God, but He doesn't want to hear you complaining. Complaining is different than asking for help in a situation. Two different things. You have troubles and struggles and things are going wrong and you just need some help. Calling on God to help you, great. Amen. Keep doing that. But complaining is different. Complaining and saying, oh man, I, you know, I, I hear sometimes from my girls at dinner, like, I didn't want to eat this for dinner. I want to have this. I want to have something else. No one wants to hear that complaining. Because, you know, from, from this example and this perspective, hey, dad worked hard to, to earn enough money to be able to have this meal. Mom worked hard to prepare this meal and to get everything together and make sure it's healthy and everything for you. I don't want to hear you complaining about it. And, and this is the way that God's thinking about with us. He's viewing us. Hey, look, I've given you all of these different things. Okay, yeah, you don't have this one thing. I don't want to hear you complaining about that. Not only is it displeasing to the Lord, it actually angers him. It gets him mad. It gets him angry. Ver the, continue on, continuing on in verse number one, it says, When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. God got so angry, he killed them. He killed some of the people. He ended up sending a plague through the people. Look at, jump down to verse number 18 in Numbers 11. This is, this is the way he deals with them. Because he ends up when he says, fine, you think you had it so good in Egypt? You want to have this flesh to eat? That's what you want? I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Look what he says. Verse 18, And say unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days. 
But even a whole month, he's like, I'm going to give you flesh for it. You're asking for it? You're going to get it. You're going to get flesh for a whole month. 30 days. He says, until it come out at your nostrils and it be loathsome unto you because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him saying, why came we forth out of Egypt? He said, I'm going to give it to you so much it's going to be coming out of your nose. Here you go. Here you go, brats, eat up because this is, this is, you're getting this for a month straight and you better just keep on eating it. And it, look what it says. It says, because you despise the Lord. They despised the Lord. They despised what the Lord had done for them. Now, it's so easy to get caught up into this type of an attitude. It really is. And we need to make sure we're focused on the right things. If they were focused on all the good things that God had done for them, there would be no place for this. There would be no place for the complaining and no place for, for, for all this extra stuff that they wanted. And, and be careful what you ask for, too. There's another lesson we can learn on this. Be careful what you're asking for because God just might give it to you. And the thing is, I think he's also getting them to understand they're, they're, they're focused on the wrong things. It's, it's, it's like the example I was given way at the beginning of the sermon. You know, you look at someone, you think they have it made. But if you were to actually be in their shoes and get everything that they have, you might find out it's not all it's cracked up to be. That's why you have these rock stars and the movie stars and these people that have a lot of fame and a lot of wealth. They kill themselves. They're drunks. They're druggies. They are in multiple marriages. They can't find happiness in their life because the money and the wealth and the fame doesn't bring you that happiness. But people will look at that and think, oh man, they have it made. It must be so nice. They have this mansion and they have all these things. They can do whatever they want and they don't have to work. And it, you know, It's not all it's cracked up to be. It really isn't. We can look at their lives and you can, I mean, example after example after example, these people are not happy. That is not the answer. And, and a lot of people today could just be focused like, man, I'm so poor. I don't have anything. And why do they have so much stuff? And they're not, you know, I'm trying to live righteous and they're living a wicked life and they have all this stuff. And then you start to complain and, and be, you know, worried about the things that you don't have instead of focus on the things that you do. I mean, you can be living in the poorest of conditions, but if you've got a loving family, hey, praise God. That is worth more than any amount of money. And I mean, there's so many, there's so many things you can look at. And, and the more you focus on the things you don't have, the, the more miserable you're going to become. Now, um, and then we see it in, in verse 31 when God brings all the, the quails in, right? And he feeds them. And Moses is surprised. He's like, what do you mean a month? Like, there's like 600,000 people here. How are you going to feed all these people for a month? That's a lot of people. He's like, are you, is, are you just going to like bring every single fish that's in the sea and like, like for us to eat? And God's like, oh, you don't believe me? <laughs> you think I can't do this? What type of God do you think I am? You think I'm not capable of providing food for these people? And he did. And it said it was, um, was like two cubits high, like three feet off the ground of quails. Just, just I mean, they're, that's how you're going to get your month's worth. But then what happened? After, you know, he says he's going to give them that much, so it comes out of nostrils. Verse number... Um, 33 says, And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. A lot of people died as a result of that. And it all stemmed from their covetousness. It stemmed from their unthankfulness. It stemmed from their complaining attitudes and not being content and not being happy with what they had already been given from God. And it cost them their life in many cases. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to have that type of an attitude. One other thing I want to point out here, we're going to jump back up to verse number 10. When you complain, it's not just you that's, that has that bad attitude then, it's infectious and it starts to spread. And you're going to bring, you know, get other people in a bad mood. You're going to have a negative impact on the people that love you and care about you. Moses loved the people of Israel. We saw that last week in my sermon on intercessory prayer. How he time and time again was going between God and the people and saying, God, don't destroy this people. 
God, I know they're wicked. I know they've done wrong, but don't destroy these people. And he kept on pleading with God and he, and, and he was winning over God's favor and, and saying, oh, God would say, okay, I'm not going to destroy this people. He was willing to destroy all the people and start all over again with Moses. And Moses was like, no, just God, you know, forgive them. Show us your long suffering. Show us your mercy. We know you're, you know, you're a great God. Don't, you know, don't let the heathen get, be able to say bad things about, you know, about you because of this. And, you know, all these different ways of pleading with him. Moses loved this people. But look at what, what happened to Moses as a result of this complaining. Verse number 10, it says, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was, greatly, was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people, saying, How am I going to be able to take care of all this people, God? This is too much for me to handle. I can't deal with all this complaining. I, you know, they're, they're coming to me and they want food and I can't do it for them, God. He says, If I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father, beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers, when should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And look what he says in verse 15. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. It impacted him so much he wanted to die literally. When you say to God, kill me, that's pretty serious. You could think to yourself and say, oh man, I wish I were dead because, you know, I mean, I've been in situations where I've experienced a lot of physical pain and discomfort and things like that where you're just like, man, I wish I could just die because this is so bad. But if you, when you're actually going to God and saying, God, I can't deal with this, just kill me. That's a whole nother level than just saying it to yourself when you're going to God and saying that because, I mean, I, and Moses knows better. He knows that God <laughs> is not someone to be challenged or tempted or, or to say things foolishly unto God. But this just shows us how he felt. He wanted to die. He was ready, he was ready to be killed as a result of all of this complaining going on by these people because he couldn't do anything about it. And oftentimes people are in a situation where you're trying really hard, especially for a family or a loved one or your kids or whatever, where you know, you're working hard, you're doing the best that you can, and, and you don't really have anything more to give that you could possibly think you could do, and it's still not enough. And if you still continue to get complaining, it, it will make you, it'll make you depressed, it'll make you start to you know, want to die. As Moses did. I mean, Moses was doing all he could possibly do for the children of Israel. All he can do. He's interceding for them, stepping in. He's trying to lead all this people, and they're still just complaining. So when you, when you have this attitude, it's not just yourself that's being affected. You are going to be miserable. You're going to be upset because you're focused on the wrong things. You're focused on what you don't have. You focus on the things that are going wrong in your life. You're going to be upset. You're going to be sad. But it's also gonna, gonna impact other people as well. And it's also gonna cause bitterness within your own soul. When you start to complain about things, you get bitter. You get you get a bad attitude. So just you know, think about this for yourself. Think about take your own life into perspective. Think about you know how much you might complain about the situation you're in. Or, or if you're able to accept where you're at and just be able to have a positive outlook and be focused on the goal and be focused on the most important things, right? Be focused on the things of God. Be focused, hey, be focused on heaven. Be focused on, you know, bringing the sheaves in with you. Be focused on the things that are going to bring joy in your life. We shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves. Hey, that's going to make you happy. If you're, if you're upset about the things that you don't have in your life, why don't you think about the rejoicing that comes with bringing your sheaves in with you? I mean, that's just one example. We can all do that. We can all do that. You have a voice. You have the Holy Spirit because you're saved. You can do that. <clears throat> Complaining can even cause other people to sin. And this is what happened with Moses. If you turn to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. It 
it wasn't just this one event where the people wanted food. This is the one we focus on because that, that whole chapter kind of dealt with that um, pretty, pretty well. Um, it covers a lot of aspects of that complaining. But there are multiple times where the, where the children of Israel were complaining in the wilderness. And um, we're going to see here, Numbers chapter 20, it actually cost Moses his opportunity to, to lead the people actually all the way into the promised land. Moses ended up sinning against God. Now, I'm not, I'm not alleviating the responsibility of Moses. It was still, he sinned, which is why God did not allow him to, to cross the river and to actually bring the children of Israel into the promised land. It was his sin. But he was also prompted to this sin as a re it was his reaction to all the complaining that the children of Israel are doing. We're going to start reading in verse number 3 of Numbers 20. The Bible says, And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. See, look at how upset they are. They're so upset, they're saying, You know, I wish God would have just killed us. Because we have such a bad time here in the wilderness. Because everything's going so wrong, I wish I would have just died. Verse number four, and why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us in unto this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. So he tells them, Okay, Moses, they need water, so speak unto the rock. And he'll bring forth water. And look at verse number 9. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And um, then it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Now, if you're confused about this story, I preach an entire sermon called The Waters of Meribah. And basically, you can see here in the chapter, God told Moses to speak unto the rock, and Moses hit the rock with his rod, which is something he had done previously to give the children, the children of Israel water. But um, he didn't, he didn't do what God commanded him to do. God said to, to speak unto the rock, and he hit it with his staff. But I think one of the reasons why he hit it with the staff is because he was angry with them. Because you see in verse 10, he says, Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch this water out of this rock for you? know, Because they're just complaining and complaining and complaining, and they prompted him to, to, to get angry and to, and to sin against God by, by not doing things the way that God told him to do it. And um, My point is just that, you know, and, and that, that might be a little bit, I don't want you to get hung up on, on the whole, um, all of the reasoning there behind why, why that was wrong for Moses to do that. But um, it was a result of, of all their complaining ultimately was, was this consequence came upon Moses. We're almost, I just want to point out a few verses that are real common in the New Testament regarding this. Um, if you want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, it'll be the last place we have you turn. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll read for you from Philippians chapter number 4. Because we need to be content with the things that we have. Is, is, is the bottom line. If you walk away with nothing else, walk away with is that, that don't have this bad attitude about things that are going wrong in your life. And look, I know it's a struggle. We, we all have different things to deal with. And some have worse things than others, for sure. Some people have really heavy burdens to bear. And I don't want to make light of those burdens. I really don't. And there's nothing wrong with grieving or mourning or, or going to God and asking for help. Those, there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, is when you just remain focused on the negative and start to have a bitter attitude and start to be unthankful for the things that you do have. That's going to lead you to destruction, that, that type of an attitude. And this is where a lot of people that that suffer from clinical depression where, where a doctor will say, oh yeah, you're depressed. And they try to give them drugs to change, just to, to force them to feel a different way. 
instead of dealing with the actual issue. Um, when you're depressed, typically people who get depressed, they're inward focused. They're focused on themselves. It's more of a, of a self-centered type of an attitude. Because um, I've met plenty of people who have been depressed before. And I've talked to them and all they seem to talk about was what's wrong with them and what are all their problems. And that self-centeredness of being focused on all of those things is what will bring you in and get you more and more depressed and make you more and more sorrowful and make you more and more sad. It's just, it, it, it's this downward spiral of grief and sorrow. And, and you have to, the only way you could snap out of that is to stop focusing on those things that are so bad in your life and focus on the good and focus on other people. Right? The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Don't be worried about the things that you need to make yourself better. What can you do for someone else? That will bring you joy. Win a soul to Christ. That will bring you joy. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. When you know someone's soul is no longer headed to hell, now they're going to heaven because you decided to, to, to not spend your time playing or whatever, you know, whatever time we could have been doing something else. And you say, you know what? No, this is important. I'm going to go and help this person out. I'm not going to use this time on myself. I'm not going to go play. I'm not going to go lay in front of the pool or go swimming or whatever, whatever it is. There's so many things you could be doing. I'm not going to work extra hours and make extra money. I'm going to go out and I'm going to preach the gospel to someone so that their soul can go to heaven when they die. That will bring you joy. That will give you the proper perspective as well because you're thinking about things that truly matter and not oftentimes the superficial things in your life like the physical things that you don't have or your car that breaks or whatever, whatever the, the, the problem might be. You're not dwelling on those things. Now, there's problems that happen. You have to deal with them. Great, I know. And they're not fun to deal with sometimes, but maintain that right attitude. Philippians 4.11 says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, abased is brought really low, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, that's a great verse. I can do all things through Christ which, which strengthens me. And so many people know that verse, but in context, what is he talking about? He's talking about being content. I know how to have nothing, is what he's saying. I know how to be brought so low to where I have, I have nothing. I mean, he was beaten. He was, you know, you think about all the things that Paul went through. He was shipwrecked, spent three days and three nights in the deep. I mean, all the, you know, in perils of robbers, perils of waters, all these different things that he went through. He's like, I've been through it. I know how to go through it. I know how not to complain about it. I know how to praise the Lord. I know how to abound. Have lots of things. Have lots of you know, physical things. Be blessed with all kinds of things. And still not reject God. Not, not you know, get lifted up with pride. I know how to, how to deal with these things. Because I'm content. If I have a lot of things, hey, I'm going to be content. This is great. Praise God. If I don't have a lot of things, I'm going to be content. Praise the Lord. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the last place we're going to look at. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. You get great gain by having contentment and being godly. Verse number 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Do you have food today? If you don't, I'll buy you a meal. Do you have clothing? Everyone here has clothing. I can see that. <laughs> we all have food. We all have clothing. The Bible says, be content. It doesn't even say, do you have a house? Do you have a place to live? Do you have food and clothing? Be content with that. Don't complain about anything else. If you don't have food and clothing then maybe you have something to complain about. Children of Israel had food. They just didn't have the food they wanted. And that's where the complaining came from. But they had the food. And if you remember, and I, I don't know where the, where the reference is to this, God made it so that their clothing lasted them throughout the wilderness. Their shoes didn't wear out and their clothing didn't, didn't just get wear out and, and, and become no good. 
God took care of that for them as well. Miraculously. I mean, they're in the wilderness for, for that long. They weren't, you know, they weren't necessarily able to set up shop and, and start, start making all the clothing because they were, they were traveling. They were wandering around the wilderness. They weren't always just staying in one place. So it wasn't, wouldn't always have been that easy to, to make extra clothing and stuff. Now, I don't know exactly how much they were able to do or whatever, but the Bible does say that, that God made it so that their shoes were, you know, were, were lasting through that time. And then the last verse here, um, the last verse is verse number nine. You know, after it tells us to be content with food and raiment, but they that will be rich, the will means you want to be, right? Those that are looking after getting rich fall into temptation. It doesn't say they might fall. It says they do fall. But they that will be rich fall in tem into temptation and a snare. A snare is just a trap. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows that attitude that that having that mindset of not being content and wanting more and it's it's ultimately a love of money a love of other things things that you don't have it's covetousness you pierce yourself through with sorrows. When you have that mindset, it's going to make you sad. It's going to make you depressed. It's going to bring destruction and perdition upon you. Such an important mindset that we need to have is, is this understanding of contentment. It is so important. It's so important for your overall happiness in this life. If you find yourself being you say, if you honestly just take a look at yourself and say, am I a happy person? Am I overall just, just I mean, pretty good? Or am I just miserable every day? Am I, am I just, just sad and depressed? Think about these things and, and start to think about and, and decide. Decide in yourself to make the change. Decide in yourself saying, you know what? When I start to see myself do this, I'm going to think on and pick something for yourself. Pick something that you are extremely happy that God has blessed you with. Whether it be your salvation, family, family member, and whatever. Whatever makes you really happy that God has given you. Say, whenever I am having a really bad time, I'm going to focus on this blessing that God has given me. And I'm going to remember these verses that, that explain that I need to be content. And, and God's not going to be happy if I start complaining about the things that I have. Other people aren't going to want to hear just complaining all the time. And ultimately, you should just, I mean, no one wants to live a miserable life. No one does. We want, we want to be happy. We want to have joy. And the joy is not going to come from the things that you don't have. That's not going to bring you the joy. God tells us the things that are going to bring us joy. And they're not, they're not the, the physical things that are in this world. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, um, we thank you so much for this great truth. God, I, this, this impacts all of us. This is something that we all have to deal with as, as your creation, dear Lord, as sinful creatures with this, with this flesh that has a desire to lust for things that we don't have. God, you truly are an amazing God and a merciful and, and a loving God and a, and a loving Father, dear Lord. Help us not to become complacent and, and demanding children like little bratty kids that just expect everything, dear Lord. We need to be appreciative for what you've done for us and, and truly humble ourselves and realize, hey, we came into this world naked and we didn't have anything. And everywhere we're at today is a result, all the things that we have is a result of your blessing and your goodness to us, dear Lord. And um, I pray that you would please strengthen us, bring to remembrance these Bible verses, whenever we struggle with this problem, dear Lord. And um, I know that we can truly lead joyful lives when, when we're focused on the good things and we're focused on serving you and we're focused on serving others, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.